Hey everybody, Jeff Scott here, uh, back with you. Um, want to give you another uh, great chunk of information today on our journey to complete understanding of regenerative medicine. And um, although today, I know there's probably a lot of you out there that want to talk about all the uh, all the great potential that some of these therapies have, but you know, I think it's important to start building that foundation to, you know, increase our biological education as it pertains to understanding regenerative medicine. So today what was important for me to do, and I, I over the next three um, presentations, we're going to spend a lot of time learning about DNA, RNA, um, how messages are made, how they're regulated, things like that. You know, we talked about cytokines not too long ago, and um, you know those are often regulated at the nuclear level, right? At the nucleic acid level, or um, either DNA itself, or the messenger RNA message. Now they can downregulate or they can upregulate. So in that context, I want to set the table and make sure that we all have. The necessary vocabulary to have good solid discussions you know about nucleic acids about how transcription takes place what translation is um, and if we can do that it's going to put you in a much better position uh, to be a more informed consumer ask more uh, direct and pointed questions of your physicians or other regenerative providers down the road. So check this presentation out. I think you'll like it. It's relatively short and I'll see you on the other side. Hey everybody. Um, we're going to talk about nucleic acids today. Um, I wanted to do this presentation just because I do think Nucleic acids are very important in understanding how the benefits from regenerative medicine are impacted. And you may ask, Jeff, why are we wasting time talking about nucleic acids? Um, but I think it's really appropriate because so much of what regenerative medicine technologies do is they affect regulation of target cells. And oftentimes that regulation comes at the level of the DNA or the RNA. Now, certainly chemical mediators released from a lot of these therapies, they can act on the cell directly and change the phenotype of that cell, change the behavior of that cell. They could act on a particular protein itself and either denature that protein or stimulate catalytic uh, uh, catalytic activity of a particular enzyme, um, but also regulating cellular function at the level of DNA and RNA is a very common uh, modality to maintain concentrations of these very potent mediators within a very tight window. And in our last uh, session on cytokines, you know, we talk about redundancy. There's a lot of redundancy built into how these mediators are regulated and regulation at the DNA and at the RNA level are certainly an important part of that redundancy. So when you talk about nucleic acid chemistry, it's important to know exactly what it is. So DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. In RNA stands for ribo or ribose nucleic acid. Okay. Um, these are pentose sugars, basically, and that's all they are. Um, they are linked to a phosphate. Okay. And interestingly, it's, it's, it's this phosphate, um, that's highly reactive. So the sugar and the phosphate form the backbone of what we know as both DNA and RNA. And then you conjugate nitrogenous cyclic bases to that sugar, okay? And it's these nitrogenous bases that are broken into two groups, purines and pyrimidines. So your purines are adenine and guanine, A and G, and your pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine, okay? Now, there are some differences between DNA and RNA fundamental chemistry. Um, if you look here, 
The first difference is, you know, what's the difference between ribose and deoxyribose? Well, at the two prime location, and that's just chemical nomenclature, um, ribose has a hydroxyl group, which is an oxygen and a hydrogen group. Deoxyribose, okay, as the name implies, does not have, it has one less oxygen. So at that same two prime location, um, it is lacking that hydroxyl group. So that's how it gets the name deoxy. So very, very similar, okay? Now the second difference is a little more substantial in that RNA does not have the pyrimidine um, thymine, okay? Rather, it has the pyrimidine called uracil. And it's interesting, I, I was wondering why in nature did that occur? Why was that so important? Because they really only differ, if you look at the two circled areas um, on those diagrams, um, thymine has a methyl group that uracil does not have. And some of the hypotheses that are out there is that thymine, because of that methyl group, um, and the way that it impacts the electrons in that ring um, is a little more resistant to exogenous influences that may inflict damage, particularly radiation, UV light, things like that. Whereas uracil might be a little more susceptible to that. But if you think about it, I would rather have my code, right, the alphabet of our life, DNA, be more resistant to those changes, those exogenous factors than, um, you know, RNA. Uh, if, if there's a mutation in RNA, well, that's going to alter the uh, effects of a single message. Whereas if I have a mutation in the DNA, it's going to alter the RNA produced in all of my messages. Okay, and this will become more clear when we talk about the processes of transcription and translation. So those are largely the two differences between um, uh, DNA and RNA. Both nucleic acids, the phosphates on each make it relatively acidic, hence the name um, uh, nucleic acid. So some more terminology for you. And again, as I mentioned, this was a very basic presentation. I, I just want us getting talk, um, you know, get us speaking the same language. But the difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide, okay? A nucleoside is just the purine or the pyrimidine nitrogenous cyclic base and the sugar, okay? Covalently linked by a glycosidic bond to the sugar, okay? A nucleotide has the phosphate also bonded to the sugar, okay? So the nucleotide is really the complete monomer. So when you're synthesizing RNA, you're synthesizing DNA, um, you know, the apparatus is grabbing nucleotides and linking them together through a condensation reaction to form a link of phosphodiester bonds um, between the phosphate and the three prime hydroxyl group of the sugar that we talked about earlier. Another key feature of especially DNA and in some cases RNA is the concept of complementarity, okay? Not all purines can interact with all pyrimidines. The purines don't interact with each other. The pyrimidines don't interact with each other, okay? So again, um, our purines are adenine and guanine, right? Our pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine, okay? Adenine only pairs with thymine in DNA, and cytosine only pairs with guanine in DNA. And these combinations are highly respected, uh, throughout your biology and throughout your genome. Um, now, again, when we talk about RNA, there is no thymine. So adenine, in the case of RNA, would pair in the event that the RNA is in a double-stranded conformation, would only pair with uracil, as there will be no thymine present uh, in the RNA. But also, one thing I wanted to point out in this particular slide is the um, 
anti-parallel orientation of DNA. So DNA has two separate strands, and they're not mirror images of each other, but they're anti-parallel. And you can see I've got circled the five prime end, which is the phosphate tail, and then I've got the three prime end, which is a hydroxyl tail. Okay, so the five prime end and the three prime ends align. And if it weren't that way, just the chemistry and the steric interactions um, and spatial orientation of, of, of those bases would not allow them to form the hydrogen bonds um, to interact in those various pairings, okay? So again, the bases are very specific to each other and the strands are anti-parallel to one another. Now, we all know the double helix of DNA it's that way because energetically it is the most stable combination, okay? But there are multiple types of double helical structures. You have the A form, which is kind of a tighter version. It's more tightly wound around centralized proteins in that strand. You have the B form, which is a little less tight, but it represents, that form represents most of the DNA in our body. That is, in general, how the DNA is existing. And then you have a Z form, which is an opposite winding of the DNA than what you see. And all of these structures um, can interchange. You know, a, a particular stretch of DNA can, can find equilibrium between either the A and B, the B and Z, or the A and Z forms. Um, it, it's, it's just one of those uh, things where, you know, um, it, for particular functions, the Z form is a more relevant confirmation than the B form. So what about RNA? I haven't talked much about RNA. We'll talk more about it when we talk about translation. But RNA structure is really related to function more so than DNA. For example, you have messenger RNA, uh, which largely exists single-stranded, and it is so important for the protein message. That's what codes for the protein message. Proteins are the language of life, right? So that messenger RNA is very, very important. Then I've got another uh, uh, type of RNA, and there are so many types of RNA out there. I just listed three very common ones. Um, you have ribosomal RNA, and you can see there's a lot of hairpin loops, so you're going to have single strand runs, you may have some helical runs, you'll have some pairing, you'll have some bulging, but that function of the ribosome, uh, which is uh, ends up becoming a nucleoprotein and is very important for protein synthesis, that structure of RNA gives it the ability to perform its functions. And then finally, transfer RNA, which is responsible for um, seeking out the amino acids in, in, in the cell to bring those to the ribosome and attach those, again, in a condensation reaction for peptide and protein synthesis. So form leads to function with RNA very often. So again, we're going to speak much more about RNA when we talk more about um, uh, transcription and translation. That's all I want to share with you today. I want to thank you for watching. Again, these slides are going to be in the description for your download and you can use them as you wish. Well, everybody, I hope that was helpful. And again, the intent of that presentation was not to turn you into a biochemist. Um, uh, to any degree, but rather to give you the foundation so that as we move forward and discuss a little more um, challenging topics, uh, you're going to hear some of those words. And it's important that you at least have some familiarity and you can recall what those are. And uh, I'll do my best to keep reinforcing that. But um, anyway, I hope that was helpful. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Uh, I love engaging with you guys and I'll, I'll answer as quickly as I can. Or you can always email me directly at workwithjeff at stayregenerative.com. Again, I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. If you're not a follower on this page, follow the YouTube channel. Uh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna be running through some really terrific material 
going forward as it pertains to regenerative medicine and cellular health. Stay regenerative, my friends. We'll see you soon.